Hi everybody. Uh, so, as Franz said, my name is Chris Sage. Um, I have a hospitality company uh, called The Herbal Chef, the acronym being THC. Um, we became wildly popular for my method of infusing cannabis into multi-course fine dining tasting menus. Um, through that journey, I learned a lot and that's what I want to share with you today. Um, today is really more about uh, a discussion. I think that there's a lot of things that are happening in the world and one of the big points and one of the big talking points is psychedelics. That includes things like cannabis, uh, fungi such as psilocybin, um, DMT, ayahuasca, ketamine, etc. The seven ethnogenic uh, uh, psychedelics that are really changing our world. I personally have had such an incredible uh, experience with the aforementioned um, that it has fundamentally changed the way I live my life. Um, when I say that, I, I, I literally mean it. It has fundamentally changed the way I live my life. How I view things, the love that I carry in my heart today, um, and how I go forth in this world are because of the experiences that I've accumulated over my 31 years of life. Um, and the majority of them happening when psilocybin and other ethnogenic plants uh, were introduced into my life. So this topic is not only extremely passionate, I'm not only extremely passionate about it, but it carries a deep sense of purpose within me. Um, so I have a little presentation for you here today. Uh, and it's really, um, you know, on the shorter end because I think that this requires discussion, this, this topic specifically. So um, if we want to change over to the presentation, um, I'm going to give myself a little bit of credibility here uh, because a lot of the times when people hear cannabis food or plant medicines and, you know, I'm used to anchoring the last, the very last uh, hour slot in every event that I've ever done because this is kind of like the odd stepchild and they, they put me at the end but then everyone ends up coming because this is where people's minds are at. Um, so I love, I love doing this. Um, but just to give me a little bit of credibility here, um, this is some of the stuff that my hospitality company has produced, um, you know, in our tasting menus. Uh, it is not a rice crispy or brownie as, as you can see. This is um, just really gorgeous uh, experiences that we're playing with. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about throughout the anti-convention was plating and how all of this... Uh, how, how to envision a plate, how to put something on the plate, what it's for, how to eat the plate based on how you're plating. All of these things are very valid, right? And then you're talking about seasonality and what ingredients to use and all of these things. What I add an extra layer uh, to my thought process on a given dish by how can I change the consciousness or how can I... Um, put something in front of them with their altered state of consciousness that is going to uh, give them a better experience. And that I think is one of the bases of psychedelic hospitality. And if I could sum up psychedelic hospitality in a couple words, um, it would be the, uh, uh, sorry, um, it would essentially be how to care for somebody before, during, and after in an altered state of mind. So um, whether you like it or not, and, and I'm assuming because you're in this room, many of you like it, uh, psychedelics are the new frontier. They're here to stay. They're, they're not going anywhere. As much as we want to potentially ignore them, um, or you feel a certain way about them, or you feel they may get muddled or in the way, they are here. So my biggest thing is that I want to put forth not only the educational component of these plant medicines, but then thoughtfulness and responsible use of them. Because ultimately, we are going to be responsible, those who administer are going to be responsible for uh, dosage and things and, and caring for the customers who are coming in and trying this. Um, so to give you an example, um, when somebody comes into our establishment or our secret supper club or 
any one of our um, fine dining events that take place around the world or we go into people's homes and create these experiences, the first thing that they always ask me is there's somebody that comes up and says, I had a really bad experience on edibles. Like, is this going to get me fucked up? And the answer is like, if you want it to, yes, but the best answer is like it this is a, an experience that we are creating together so if that's not what you want what we recommend is 10 milligrams throughout an entire 10 course tasting menu which is coming in over two and a half hours just out of curiosity how many of you have tried edibles before 90 percent of the room how many of you have gotten too high off of the edible 90% of the room. So this is <laughs> any of you uh, that know what that feels like knows that it feels close to death, close to death. Um, so, you know, it would be, it would be in my best interest, interest as a business owner to never allow that to happen, which is why the protocols are so strict within my company and why I take the educational component and the uh, dosage component so seriously. Um, in fact, a, a small shameless plug, I have a book out that's in Barnes and Noble and uh, in all of uh, Urban Outfitters now that I literally go through step by step how to dose because it is so important to me that I do, don't believe in the gatekeeping of it at all. Like it is mapped out so that you never have to um, worry about how much you're actually ingesting. Um, and uh, so the reason that I'm here is because this is a new frontier and psychedelics as a whole, yes, I'm using a broad term and yes, I have focused on cannabis and psilocybin in the past, but with everything that's going on with psychedelics, um, you know, I find it interesting that it is such, it is such a sterile environment. The way that um, usually any ethnogenic plants get legalized are through the medical system. So clinical trials are being done right now for psilocybin, MDMA, uh, DMT, and uh, 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 ketamine. Thank you. Um, so ketamine and all of these things, they're done in such a sterile environment that I think that it loses the allure of hospitality. It loses like what it's really about, which is feeling comforted, which is feeling safe. And Yes, while having doctors present is probably part of what may make some people feel safe, I think the other part of that is being hospitable before, during, and after with the care that you can give somebody um, in this particular state of mind. So just so you guys know um, a little bit more, like there's one in four U.S. citizens have tried at least one psychedelic. That's 28% of the U.S. population have tried one of the seven. Um, and then people with postgraduate degrees, we're talking almost 50% of them have tried it. And then, um, you know, going into the medicinal side, because that is inevitably the first legal licensing that is ever available for any given drug. Um, there is 88% reduction in clinically depressed uh, uh, patients for these studies. And this is coming out of John Hopkins University. I link everything in the bottom there. Um, but this is, it, it's almost unfathomable because you have this opioid epidemic that has taken, I don't know, it takes like a quarter of a million people every year. Um, I think actually more. And then uh, on top of that, you have the addiction qualities that come with it. And yet there is this mushroom, this fungi that grows in cow shit and it has, it has almost erased depression for years to come for people who have been um, clinically depressed. If that doesn't tell you that there is something there worth studying, then I don't know what will because um, it essentially is showing efficacy beyond our wildest dreams and beyond anything that's in the um, current market right now. Um, so I've touched on it a little bit, but how does it all relate to hospitality? I think personally, um, you know, what, what's happened, you know, with the legalization of cannabis, once it gets decriminalized, then all of a sudden you have people popping up everywhere. Um, you know, you, you can buy from Freddie down the street corner and you won't get popped. That's great. But then it graduates into actual legalization and licensing. And then you go down to the, uh, the market 
or the dispensary and you pay $80 for an eighth that you bought from Freddie for $35 and um, you, you buy it in an environment which is set up um, by the government or the, the parameters are set up by the government and it feels a little bit sterile. The bud tenders don't exactly know what they're talking about um, and they're really just trying to sell whatever uh, legal cannabis they can. And the, le the people who get the legal cannabis are the ones who lobbied for it. And if you follow the trail, essentially those who have the most money have gotten the licenses which are then pushing the, the cannabis. And this works for all drugs. So if you are um, trying to get something where you go in and you, you have a personable relationship with somebody that can actually help you, guide you into what you want. For instance, like my own mother going to a dispensary and saying, well, what do I get? Um, and she's having to ask her son rather than the person that she's going to buy the weed from. This is an opportunity for us in the hospitality uh, industry to put forth what we do best. We take care of people. This is how we can do that. We can give them an experience in which helps them understand what they're taking. And I'll take it a step further and in our dinners, that is how we take care of people is we, first off, we educate them because when they come in, they don't know what they want. I know what they want because I've done this so long that I can, I can guess that you want to have a great time. You want to come in maybe with your friend, with your husband, with your wife, with your partner, you, you want to come in with whoever you're with and you want to have a great time. You want to leave that place. You want to leave where you are feeling fantastic, having a great story, feeling with your belly full and great memories. That is likely what anybody wants at any given time. And if we can provide that in a safe environment, which also gives them the opportunity to control their own dosing and to make them feel comfortable in what you're giving them and to make sure that the product is clean and not having heavy metals or pesticides or all these other um, fillers that often come with, uh, with terrible product, then that is what hospitality can mesh into this world and, and really help sort of the clinical, scientific, uh, sterile side see. Because, um, and, and for those of you that haven't uh, explored in ayahuasca, I'll give another example. Ayahuasca is a very, it's an eight hour experience um, that oftentimes is fully consuming you. And meaning that you're not really um, able to control sort of your surroundings. And it's best that you are um, in a safe space that uh, you've set up beforehand. Part of the hospitality that I learned from the Shibibo tribe down in Peru was setting up the maloka. The maloka is where we are, um, where the ceremony takes place. Part of the setup is having a bed, having a bucket, having a blanket, having a pillow. Just simple things, right? But think about that from a hospitality perspective. Like when, um, you know, if I, am, if I am thinking about this, how can I make, how can I have cold water for, you know, the eight hours? How can I have fresh juices? How can I have a warm towel, a, a cold towel, a, all these different things that are coming into the world where, um, you know, now retreats are becoming a major player in the uh, hospitality uh, economics. These are things in which hospitality uh, can improve upon an already existing system and create new ones. Um, so like I was saying, the before, during, and the after. Um, how to set a space and your mind in preparation for a psychedelic experience. Working in tandem with yogis or with therapists to uh, sort of vet out the people that are coming into the retreat and then actually setting up the space that you need and then uh, getting them ready for the experience at hand. Uh, the during, which is what to have on hand to make it more pleasant. For those of you um, that have experienced altered state of consciousness, you know that there's certain things that are absolutely mind blowing. For instance, having a tangerine while you're mid trip is like blows your fucking mind. Like the first time that I ever had a banana or that, you know, I say that I ever had a banana, uh, was in Peru after the first ceremony of ayahuasca and they have these little green bananas and I tasted pineapple and green apple and kiwi and, and a banana. It was just the most wild thing out of this little tiny banana. And, you know, to have that experience changed my 
perspective on what we can do to actually uh, give people a brand new experience that they've never really had before. And then of course afterwards, um, you know, one of the things that I learned while doing these ceremonies around the world was they're really like, okay, thank you so much, take, you know, give me your money, have the experience and get out. And they kind of tell you like integration process is very important but they, they kind of just shoo you on to the next one so they can usher in the next set of people because this is overall a business. I think that the integration process is by far the most important part and I'm going to, of course I'm talking about ayahuasca right now, but I'm going to give you a more um, uh, perhaps approachable um, anecdote from cannabis and what we do in our, uh, in our business because not everybody is going to operate and, and work with ayahuasca retreats, but it, you can start to see the image of what psychedelic hospitality actually can mean and where the opportunity lies. How to integrate yourself, because I guarantee in the next, you know, um, five years, all these ketamine clinics that have opened up in the past year, all the different psilocybin projects that have um, come and, uh, and opened up in Oregon and Colorado and whatnot, they're gonna, there's, there's already 11 states um, that have decriminalized either partially or the whole state in the United States for psilocybin. Um, and some for MDMA and there's only four states out of the entire United States that doesn't have any legalization of cannabis. So this wave is coming and my purpose of being here is if you have the opportunity to get involved then do so because this is going to be a massive opportunity but do so with thoughtfulness and with responsibility to the plant because these are extremely powerful. So afterwards, the care that goes into writing down their thoughts or writing down or, um, you know, uh, making sure that you have a Uber system that is set up so that they can pick, get picked up very easily after the experience and get taken home. Those are the type of things that I'm talking about for aftercare. Um, so essentially, um, the rates of inquiry between 2000 and 2023 have grown ex uh, uh, exponentially and lends to my point that ultimately we are driving this um, and we are going to have a point in which we have the opportunity to meet the industry as hospitality professionals and there's going to be partnerships that are created through all of this. Um, so what I think the future holds is, is a whole lot. And you know, regarding cannabis, it's already here. If you haven't gotten on the cannabis train, you're likely already late. But there is time to get on to the psychedelics as a whole and to position yourself to, uh, to be an asset to these other companies that are popping up and wanting to, uh, you know, express their or wanting to uh, make money off of the uh, psilocybin, off of the ketamine, off of the other uh, ethnogenic plants and drugs that are being uh, legalized right now. And my purpose of being here is to uh, plead with every one of us to do so responsibly and lovingly because these do have the power, in my opinion, to change the world. And for those of you that have tried them, um, I, I, I know that I'm not speaking just for myself. Um, so I wanted to open up the floor and really have a discussion about some of the things that we are having today or uh, some of the things that we've been talking about today and then kind of talk about um, some, some of the more nuances. There's a bunch of questions on the WOVA app that um, I'll go through as well. Um, one of them being like the med medicinal benefits and you know uh, I'll talk about that first just because we're going to jump into that. Um, but I'll go through cannabis because cannabis has um, incredibly uh, uh, succinct benefits that have been um, now studied in clinical trials for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's some studies that show a lot more, uh, a lot longer than that, and we'll talk about those as well. But um, essentially, cannabis has, is made of uh, THC as the main psychoactive component um, that and it comes from THCA. So when you look at a bud, you have it's non-active. If you were to eat that, you would just get some benefits from 
some of the terpenes and cannabinoids that exist. But once you light it on fire, that THCA turns into THC and becomes psychoactive, which is where you get that high. Um, within that plant, though, there are hundreds of cannabinoids. And all of these cannabinoids are absorbed into the body through two places, the um, CB1 and CB2 receptors, which are the CB1 is within the brain um, because your brain is literally set up to receive cannabinoids. And then CB2, your nervous system. And it goes through all of your major organs and regulates all your major organs. So there are direct benefits to actually um, uh, ingesting this plant and which is why um, personally I have found that edibles are uh, the best method because one you know as you're giving it to somebody who may be afraid or not used to it if you give them a plate of food and they eat it they're receiving the benefits they're getting the, they're going to have the experience that you would hope for them and also they're not afraid of it which is a big thing but then dosage comes into play so um, cannabis is, you know, the efficacy has been proven over and over again for years. Um, and now I'm going to open up the uh, floor for some questions here before I go into the WOVA app. I saw somebody over there. Yes. Um, do I have somebody coming around with a, oh, thank you. I was curious. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. As Chris, can you walk us through like what a two and a half dinner, two and a half hour dinner looks like? Like, what's the intro, the mid, the conclusion? Like, how do you personally handle that in your own events? Yeah, that's a lovely question. So, um, going back to you know uh, uh, some of those dishes, right? So, as as soon as. Um, for Secret Supper Club, you get an email 24 hours before, after you've you know paid and signed up, and then uh, 24 hours before the event, you get the location and the password. You show up to the event, and there's a doorman or woman, and they are asking for the password. You come in. It feels you know it's dimly lit. It's it's more like natural, and and then um, as you sit down, uh, we usually have a welcome drink. Um, it could be NA or it could be alcoholic. We have, throughout the two and a half hours, um, there is usually four ounces of liquor that's, that we've uh, allowed and um, two ounces of wine in addition to the 10 milligrams of THC and the 10 milligrams of CBD. The um, first three courses are small amuse-bouche and they're um, really to like, you know, light the palate up. So at this point in course one and two, you're likely not feeling anything, but you are getting the largest portion of your dosage in course one and two. Uh, and then course three is when it starts to take effect um, as alcohol also acts as a metabol uh, the catalyst for the metabolism of THC. So this is all thoughtfully planned. Like if we had a grid, I could show you like exactly when people will feel it, how long we're gonna keep them in that euphoric zone, and then when it'll drop off and, and uh, cascade through the uh, CBD and into like a relaxing atmosphere. So um, th course three, four, five um, is where it starts to really take effect and you start to hear the decibel level of the event go way up. Everyone's giggling, laughing, like it's, it's the most precious thing you could ever imagine. Um, and then uh, course six, seven, eight is gonna finish out our, uh, our savory courses. Um, so, and then nine and 10 are dessert courses where the CBD is. So you have, um, typically if somebody were to get 10 milligrams, you would get two milligrams, one milligram, one milligram, all the way to eight. Um, and then course eight, and then you would go into five milligrams of CBD, five milligrams of CBD for the desserts. Um, so that's what you can kind of expect. And um, each course is, you know, we, we are sourcing from Japan for our fish. We're getting the very best uni. We're getting the very best caviar. We're getting the very best uh, beef, lamb, et cetera. So all, all of what you can expect going to a really beautiful dining establishment, you're still getting but it's now infused with the cannabis um, that, we, that we do. Thank you. So clearly using the best ingredients, um, you're not doing the old school, take your bag of shake and infuse it into your butter and make your brownies. Um, how are you sourcing 
what exactly are you using to put the THC into the food? How do you source that, and what's that process? Um, you, you already talked about quantities, um, but you know, how do you measure it, and how do you source it, and what is it? So this is a great question. So the sourcing of all of this is extremely important because there's a lot of peddlers of snake oil, and that's that's not what we're into. So the first uh, thing that I do is find the purveyor, and the purveyor is a cultivation. And legally, we have to do this. So my company is completely above board. Nothing we do is illegal, and that was you know designed because I didn't want to get in trouble with my face on you know magazines and whatnot. Um, so we go to the cultivation. The cultivation, uh, we make sure that one, they're growing practices are sound and two that they have great products so I'll usually sit there with the growers I'll smoke it I'll, I'll taste it etc you get one feeling like that right and then I'll take um, I'll take that and we'll make live rosin out of it live rosin is the holy grail of the cannabis world it keeps every uh, nuance every cannabinoid intact in the actual plant. So it's like taking the plant and then cold uh, and then gently pressing it with very gentle heat until all of the terpenes is squeezed out. Uh, all the cannabinoids, terpenes, etc., are squeezed out. So you have the most flavor, the most cannabinoids and the THC in there that you could possibly use. We then take that liquid, which is pure gold, literally it's like $65 an ounce. And, um, we take that and we dilute it into our base solution, which is usually um, an avocado oil. And then from the avocado oil, I, I can titrate it so that it's exactly per one milliliter or 0.1 milliliter, it's one milligram of THC. And then that gets used throughout the entire menu because everybody's um, tolerance is different. We don't want to force anybody into getting cannabis either. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable. So if you came and you said, oh, I, I'm not, I don't want any actually, I just want to have the meal, that's no problem. The, it, let's say that in course five, you wanted to, you know what, everyone's having a great time. I want to try this, which happens all the time. Um, then we add in uh, what you feel comfortable with or you're, you're going to follow our recommended uh, dosage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask out a couple questions. So when you're making like a sauce, I'm trying to figure out what the measurement would be. Like if you're trying to make a sauce... And then the second question is about liability issues. What are your concerns? Like if something bad was to happen, and have you had any experiences with that and what that's like? So um, to answer your question, um, the first one, and I, again, I, I did a lot of work in this book. Um, it was published by Simon & Schuster, and it literally breaks down every single little thing that you need um, by gram so that you can dose whatever you want. Um, and that's in the bookstore here. Um, so it'll give a much more thorough answer than I'm going to give right now. But essentially, it, um, you, you can start with that live rosin and then you uh, titrate it into an, a fat because cannabis is lipid soluble. So uh, with that, you know, that, that's how you're going to dose your sauces. Um, and then you have to do by volume and weight. So that way each sauce, because you, you know that you're going to put one ounce on the plate in order to complete the dish, then you know one ounce is equal to five milligrams or two milligrams, whatever you're trying to dose it out to. Uh, the second question, uh, what was the second question again? Liability. Um, so there, in the very beginning, I had one experience where um, a gentleman... Uh, wanted 200 milligrams and um, you'd be fucking surprised it's crazy people are crazy um, but uh, it's um, so th how he reacted to the 200 milligrams was not great and um, so that that moment I had a very harsh realization that I needed to um, have liability waivers so the liability waivers exist beyond 50 milligrams. Under 50 milligrams, we're, we've never had a problem with anybody. And um, for our huge events, we usually have some sort of combination of therapist and yogi that is on staff 
to sort of, if anybody has an experience where they feel overwhelmed, we usually um, escort them into another area where it's like a very zen safe room and then they can just have a conversation or be held or you know whatever they're going through because the the reality is when um doing psychedelics sometimes things come up and sometimes you just have to deal with them good question though oh i i have a question sorry i have the microphone yes i don't know where you are i can't see anything (laughs) did you does someone else need to go first yes okay so with the hemp drive market um you know, we talk about CBDs a lot, but I know that there's a lot that is sort of outperforming in CBGs and CBN, but I don't know what the difference is. Do you, can you expand upon that at all? Yeah. So like I said, there's hundreds of cannabinoids. So when you're getting the CBGs and the CBNs, those play specific roles in uh, how it interacts with your body. And given the terpenes that may be present in that extract, whenever you're getting an isolate, that means that you're isolating a compound through fractal distillation and you're having just THC, just CBG, just CBN, whatever it is, right? And personally, I don't think that that is a way to ingest any medicine. There is natural entourage effects that happen in medicine that are beneficial to the body and the psyche um, that should be taken into account. So all these new products that are coming out with CBN, CBG, they generally understand that. Um, because, you know, when you look on the packaging, and if they don't understand that, you'll, you'll be able to tell them this way. Look at the packaging. Make sure that the percentage of CBG, CBN is the dominant percentage, and those will then tell you what type of experience you're going to have. But make sure that it's not an isolate. And to give you a more direct answer on what it is, CBN actually acts as natural melatonin. Um, CBG is in that same category and can actually help you fall asleep. And I think that there's a gentleman over here as well after her. Hello. So I'm not familiar with this world at all. And Great. Welcome. So you, said, <laughs> you said that you start the dinners with THC and finish with CBD. Mm-hmm. Now, I do see a lot of CBD products on the market for beauty products and such. So why do you finish with CBD? So CBD generally is... Um, you know, everything that we use first and foremost is full spectrum. When I say full spectrum, it doesn't only, when, like we talk about CBD, that is an isolated compound in a uh, entourage of compounds that exist within the plant. So CBD, um, when I say that, we're actually using a full spectrum CBD. It has CBG, it has CBN, it has um, all these different other compounds that are in there. And then it also has terpenes. And terpenes are their flavor and aromatic volatile compounds that are within the plant, but that also play a role in the mood imparted to the consumer. Um, so when you're, wh- wh- why we finish with CBD, a full spectrum CBD extract is because, um, so THC and that live rosin is going to get you high and you're going to experience this level of, you know, awareness and, um, you're eating the food now and you're like, holy shit, I didn't even taste this before. And so you're having this whole experience and it's kind of, uh, more cerebral. And then what CBD does is bring it a little bit down into this more ephemeral, uh, biological, um, physical uh, relaxation. And so when we are creating an experience and designing this experience, we want it to be something that actually um, brings you up and then keeps you in this euphoric zone and then leaves you in a state of relaxation. Because honestly, who, what, what's better than that? Like... I, I don't even know an experience that would I, I could go to that would leave me better off than that. Like that is how I would want to end my evening. You know, is doing that, and then um, oftentimes we have our uh, guests in their own home, um, and then they'll you'll see them as we're done cleaning up and we're saying our goodbyes. Everyone's chilling out on the couch, like laying all over each other. And like, that's kind of the, really what we want. We want people to like thoroughly feel so comfortable that they can just lay down and relax. There's a gentleman over here. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for being here. I appreciate this, this session. It's thanks, man. very important for hospitality. Um, 
I know you said you only do a certain amount of milligrams. Now, when you do your dinners, um, obviously certain guests ask for more milligrams. Do you do a specific, you said 10 milligrams. So is that 10 milligrams C THC and then 10 milligrams of CBD for the whole dinner? Is that like an, a normal average kind of dinner or how do you base that? So the way that we pose it is that for anybody who's never tried this, this is what we recommend. We recommend 10 milligrams throughout the entire dinner. So that's and 5 THC, then 5 CBD? 10 milligrams THC, 10 milligrams okay. CBD. Cool. And it, um, it gets dispersed throughout two and a half hours. So it is not like a typical edible where you eat it all at once and then 45 minutes later, right. just as you've forgotten that you've taken anything, <laughs> it donkey kicks you into, you know, a... Uh, uh, with your head on in your ass. Right. So this is like a more of a gentle come up. So a and, gradual come up and then the nice kind of... And then the nice gradual up. takedown. Now, is that something through your experiences that you found to be more productive for these types of dinners instead of you know, throwing 50, 80 milligrams at someone and they're blasted out of the moon and then trying to bring them back down to earth? Well, you know... The way that I describe it to the guests is, you know, you're, you're your own adults. You can make your own decisions. I'm not here to police you or anything. You want to sign the waiver, go ahead, sign the waiver. Yeah. But if you want to have the experience that I have curated for 10 years now and have perfected over tens of thousands of different events, tens of thousands of, uh, of guests coming through, then this is what I recommend. And 90% of the time, the vast majority of people will go with my recommendation. And then, you know, there's other people who are like, I can't even feel it unless I have 300 milligrams. And I'm like, well, I mean, we're going to test that theory. And um, I swear to God, though, this one lady and her whole, her whole friend group, th 350 milligrams each, I would have trusted her to drive me home. She didn't, she didn't even bat an eye. So like everyone is so wildly different that you have to give them the option of being able to choose your own adventure. After all, they are hiring my business yeah. in order to do this. And I don't want to deprive them of, of what they came for. But in addition to that, I want to make sure that they're well educated in making that decision, that they're not just like, oh, I want to get as high as possible because I'm here. Right. And like, you're going to miss out on the experience completely. Yeah. Um, 350 milligrams? That's oh, yeah. insane. It's that crazy, insane. man. You've seen someone do that and like walk? I watched somebody do 500 milligrams. I watched a couple for their anniversary do 500 milligrams. And I'm like, I, I'm not even going to comment on it, how, actually. How often do you have people even want to do upwards of like 50? How often does that happen? Uh, it's rather abnormal. Most of the time, it will be in the 10 to 25 range. Like I would okay. say 80% of the time. I really find, I find that extremely hard to believe. I mean, I believe what you're saying, but 350 million, I mean, that's nuts. People have insane tolerances. And, wow. you know, one thing to take into account is we do a lot of medical uh, dinners as well for people that have severe medical conditions. And sometimes that's their starting number, like is 300 grams. And they'll take that twice a day. Um, I believe there's, yeah, there's some... Folks over here, and they're up in the first row too. So you said you put, uh, you dose the salt or the avocado oil, and then how does that get perfect? Or do you use that as bulk, or do you microdose each plate, if you will? So given, how do you, how do you get it, that consistency? Yeah, so the consistency is really what sets my business apart. Like, I, I was the first one to go into this industry and do fine dining in this way. And so I, I basically learned very quickly that there are certain methods that you have to employ in order to make things consistent. Because as a chef, you know, I know that I, I weigh every single ingredient out by gram. Like, my recipes are all grammed out. There's nothing left to, you know, like finesse or anything like that. It's like, I want this perfect every single time. And that's the approach that I took to cannabis as well in dosing. Not only because, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, probably the right thing to do, but um, it's like you want the person to be able to come back. Like if you get your favorite edibles, your, your gummies or your mints or whatever, and each time you popped one, you had no idea how high you were going to get. 
those wouldn't be your favorite anymore. So the reason, like, I, I think the consistency is key and how we do it is by titrating through each dish. So when we're doing large events, we have everybody's labeled as if it's a dietary restriction and every, our hospitality director, um, he goes around the table and talks to everybody individually after I've given the spiel. So that way, um, or whoever is running the, the dinner that evening gives a spiel. They go around and get everybody's individual dosage. And then we come back, we mark the women, we mark the men, we mark uh, where, uh, how much they're getting and what they're doing, and then any dietary restrictions. And then they're getting that exact number and we're potentially leaving off or switching the, the dairy for it or whatever it may be. Yeah, earlier you had mentioned uh, the opioid crisis, and uh, Kratom is a plant that's entered the American market. I've seen tangible uh, benefits, but it's been highly stigmatized since it's kind of hit the scene. I was curious to hear if that's something you've ever thought about using in your hospitality practice or elsewhere. So um, that, that brings up a really good point that I feel is really worth touching on. So Kratom is one of those things that tastes awful and it is extremely pungent. It would not include itself in the dining experience, but it would in the beginning or at the end. And I think those have very special roles. Um, in addition to that, you know, the way that I serve cannabis is not the way that I would serve uh, psilocybin, and it's not the way that I would serve ayahuasca, and it's not the way I would serve peyote, not the way I would serve ketamine, etc. Like the the each one has its own hospitality to it. For instance, psilocybin, you're not going to be hungry, and you're definitely not going to want to sit in a seat for two and a half hours. Like it's just not happening. Everyone loses focus, and it, like it's just a mess. Everyone's all over the table. It's a crazy time. That's that's not what psilocybin hospitality is going to be like. What psilocybin hospitality is to me is creating an experience, having an overnight experience where in the beginning we fast and then um, we go into the chocolate bar or I recently for uh, Double Blind Magazine made a uh, blue honey, so mushroom infused pineapple sage soda that you can drink and then um, you go through the ceremony and then afterwards, when you, you know, during the experience, there's fruits and there's nuts and, and natural ingredients to kind of help you along the way. And then at the very end, when you have come down from that experience and you are now ravenously hungry, there's a multi-course tasting menu. And to digest and to integrate the th lessons learned within that and to talk to amongst the group that was experiencing it with you. So that's vastly different than what cannabis is, where you can actually enjoy it during the meal. And same thing with ayahuasca. There's a lot of these psychedelics that you just aren't hungry on, like period. And you know, that's not the experience that you want right there. But you can still be hospitable before, during, and after in the way that you, um, you bring it about. Gentleman in the red over there? I don't know where she, oh. Yep. Right oh, here. yes. So multi-layer question for you. In terms of ingredients and palatability, are there any that you say are greatly enhanced when you use it and infuse it, or those that are adversely affected by infusing with it that just don't taste good that you would avoid? So there, your yeah. So your question is: Are there anything that enhances it? Are there any things that are greatly enhanced by infusing with it, or those that are adversely affected by just taste awful when you infuse with it and you would not use within your meals? So generally speaking. Um, there are a few things that will actually enhance the experience and the, and the bioavailable um, psychoactive components within it. So if you're talking psilocybin and you put um, like uh, lemon juice in with your powdered psilocybin, it'll actually break down the, the enzymes on the outer wall and you won't have as much nausea and the effects will come on much quicker. Um, and then, you know, acidity seems to be across the board something that helps the effects of all of these um, compounds. So for cannabis specifically, drinking orange juice, having, pardon me, having mango and, and then black pepper um, is, are things that will actually enhance the experience. Yep. And are there any that you would avoid with it that just give a negative experience or flavor just muted out some ways the things to avoid are because you're you're um if you look at it from a metaphysical perspective you are you're energetically like expansive 
and you are energetically um, uh, sort of vulnerable. And if you can imagine yourself expanded three, four, five times the size that you are right now, your stomach is not tight and like able to process a lot of foods and big things. So if you can imagine from a medical physical, uh, metaphysical perspective, you don't want to eat things that are, you know, heavy because ultimately what you're doing is allowing yourself to become um, the universe is become you know to explore whatever is within you, and that on in it of its own you know without getting too woo woo is like you don't want to have things that are actively weighing you down, and so eating lots of things or having um, heavy meals are are going to be um, counteractive to what you feel and the potency that you feel, and then overall I think your experience as a whole. But there's no like ingredient that is like. This is bad. This is a good discussion, guys. Uh, before my question, just a side note, I had caught your interview on the All Out show with Rude Jude a couple nice. years ago. And yeah. loved that show. That was a, that was a great interview. Um, enjoyed that. Thanks. Um, so for a kind of broader restaurant um, question, obviously you probably know more about, you know, red tape and legislature and upcoming, you know, changes in any of that. Obviously we, there's no avenue to be selling alcohol and um, THC products in a business currently, but do you see any time in the near future a possibility where CBD can be used um, in potential food products in a restaurant that also serves alcohol? Or is that something that even though there's, whether it's broad spectrum, full spectrum, any trace amount, it's just not going to happen? So I actually had a business, a bar, um, that utilized CBD in the beverages. Um, but you, you can't make it an alcoholic beverage because for whatever reason, that's what they've decided was the, the hard no. Um, so as it sits right now, the legislation... Um, basically, you cannot have CBD in dairy or anything that's, uh, I believe, perishable, but it's definitely dairy and, um, and other uh, milk products um, or animal products. And then you can have it in baked goods. So if you have a bakery, go ahead. And then um, you can't have it in alcoholic beverages. So for whatever reason, that's where they decided to draw the line. Um, to give you an example of how ridiculous the legislation is, um, when I wrote uh, the legislation that was later um, passed in uh, West Hollywood, uh, what I wrote and what got passed were so vastly different, it was as if I had no input at all. Um, but th what they passed was, if you go to a cannabis restaurant, you cannot not order cannabis. Meaning, you go there, you have to order cannabis. So imagine going with somebody who just wanted to come along and maybe get some food or whatever. Couldn't happen. They have to order cannabis. That is how deranged the licensing is um, and how they, they do not understand the, the culture of what we actually want. And that is why I think through doing this and educating, we've been able to create something that people actually want to be involved in. Cool. Um, um, we're, we're technically at, at time for the session, okay, but cool. we got such a late start. Chef, you want to take another there's couple questions? There's these two, and then we'll, we'll call it from there. There's a gentleman right behind you to your left, and then there's the gentleman up here in the front. There's somebody that, yeah. So I know that you stated that most of your infusions were done through uh, avocado oil and doing the oil dosing. I wanted to just get your thoughts on cannabis beverages and nano emulsions. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love nano emulsions. I think that they're definitely, like, one, they help homogeneity in beverages. And, you know, the, the biggest problem over the past four years of nanotechnology was that it was clumping to aluminum. And they've since figured out that, that issue because they were canning beverages. And then they were finding it that it stuck to one side. And then, therefore, they weren't really getting anything until the last sip or they weren't getting anything at all because it was sticking to the aluminum. So a lot of those kinks have been worked out, and I think nano emulsification is wonderful. Also, tinctures, very, very easy, and um, very easy to homogenize as well. For those of you that are unfamiliar with nano emulsification, it's literally breaking down the particle size and then having them um, connect through a web 
of nanoparticles so that it creates this large blanket and can homogenize into any liquid, including non-lipid bases. Yeah, big big fan of nano emulsification and the and tinctures as well. Yeah, it was this gentleman. Were you if you still okay? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so you touched a little bit on like the legality and the paperwork side, and I was just curious. Um, do you need like something like a reseller's license to to purchase the cannabis and then get it to the customer? Um, Essentially, you need, yes, you need a reseller's license, but you also need a um, partnership and a contract with a cultivator that has a license um, in order to, to then give that cannabis away. So it, technically, we give the cannabis away in that, in that particular setting. Um, and then I, I think that I'm going to be signing some books here and whatnot, but I'll be around for some questions as well. But I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming here last day, rocking it out all weekend long, and uh, being here for the very last presentation. It's, uh, it means a lot to me, sincerely. Thank you guys.